This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. From Microbe TV, this is TWIV, This Week in Virology, episode 697, recorded on December 23, 2020. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to the podcast all about viruses. Joining me today from southeastern Michigan, Kathy Spindler. Hi, everybody. Here it's 40 degrees Fahrenheit, which is 4.4444444 degrees Celsius, and it's going up to 50 today. Pretty amazing for December 23rd. Wow. wow. We have five Celsius, and all the snow melted almost in the past few days that we got 10 inches or so last week. Too bad. Also joining us from Austin, Texas, Rich Condit. Hey there. 66 degrees and cloudy going up to 79. <laughs> well, that's Texas, of course. It's normal, right? Well, What's that's the December the average? Side. What was the December average? Oh, my. Yeah, you're going to make me look up these data? No, no, I don't, don't, worry, don't worry about it. It's okay. <laughs> uh, it's lower than 80. Okay. All right. Okay. That's, that's probably good. 70, I'll bet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Also joining us from, well, not from Madison, New Jersey, from upstate New York, Brian Barker. Hi. It's great to be here. Um, given that it is upstate New York, it is uh, 30 degrees Fahrenheit, negative one Celsius, and we are going to have a high of 37. Uh, so a little colder. So when I first saw Brienne on the video, she's got this, you know, fuzzy sweater and it looks like a ski slope behind her. I thought, oh, she's skiing. But it's not. It's not. <laughs> it's at your parents' house, right? Yes, exactly. So are they, are they excited that you're doing a podcast from their house or they don't really they care? Are, they are pretty excited. Cool. Um, <laughs> I, I have done a podcast from here before, uh, but I have not done it on video. So it took a little more setup than I was expecting. So, uh, pardon me, uh, Brianne, I've been uh, yes. looking up uh, Texas weather. Where exactly <laughs> are you? Uh, um, my parents live in a small town named Camden, New York. Um, you know, Google Maps here. Yes. Um, because, you, you, you know, I'm no stranger to this uh, area, having spent yes. 12 years in Buffalo. Buffalo, yeah. Right. So, further east and further north. Yep, I see. How far are you from the Canadian border? Hour, hour and a half, maybe. Oh, cool. Um, well, There's that, sort I, of a I, leak in the way. <laughs> I, I appreciate that you have brought your podcasting gear with you. It's very nice of you. Yes. Uh, average temperature in uh, Austin in December is 60. Average high is 63. Average low mm -hmm. is uh, 43. So we're looking at what? Um, 15 degrees above average today. So you're going to be up there for a week, uh, Brianne? Uh, yes, I'm here for about 10 days. All right, so probably next week's TWIV, you'll be up, you know, obviously you'll do it from there, right? Uh, I'm coming back on Monday. I've been here since last oh. weekend. Oh, okay. Got it. Okay. No, I don't need to know all that. I'm sorry to probe. But, <laughs> no, uh, you, you do. <laughs> and, so does, and so do 100,000 other people. <laughs> I uh, want to just remind everyone that the Aaron Diamond AIDS Research Center at Columbia University Irving Medical Center, they're still looking for a, uh, an assistant manager to help run the operations of the BSL-3 facility. And that's a containment lab where you work on viruses like uh, SARS-CoV-2. We'll put a link in the show notes. I don't want to read the whole ad again. I've done that for a few weeks. I'll give you a break today. Uh, but if I believe it's still uh, open, so check that out. And um, Kathy, you want to say anything about ASV? I'll just be brief too. ASV.org, now is a good time to update your membership, particularly if you want to apply for a registration award. Abstract deadlines are February 1st, and that's really coming up quickly. So join, get your abstract ready, get your registration application ready. Next Wednesday will be the last episode for 2020, right? And 700. And that's number 700, right. That's pretty cool. And I tell you, you know, we hit 600 earlier this year, right? Mm -hmm. And I thought, well, another two years before we hit 700. <laughs> there in less than a year. Oh my gosh. 
uh, someone said to me that I should go back and take some highlight clips from previous TWIVs of this year, which would be fun oh, to yeah, do. Oh, yeah, like you got all kinds of time to do that, right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that would be the kind of thing I do on Christmas Day. I disappear in the basement. My family's like, hey, Dad, what are you doing? I wouldn't do that, no. But I would like to do it because uh, we've had, since we started doing video, um, we've we've had some interesting uh, episodes. But, you know, I'd love to play that first one in January where you say, hey, there's this virus in China. What's going on here? Might be interesting to do that. But yeah, I will take time to go through them all because they're all on our, our archived on drives stored away. And um, I have to pull them out, uncompress, you know, blah, blah, blah. So it's kind of a bit of work. You but can't just it, get them from the internet like the rest of us? <laughs> they wouldn't be high not, enough quality. <laughs> not, not to edit them, no. Right. Yeah, right. I mean, nobody would probably notice if I did that, <laughs> but I would... It's easier. If, yeah, I could do that. I could just download them all and, and edit them off uh, the interwebs. Yeah, I guess so. I might do it at some point. It's not going to happen before the end of the year, though. All right. So today we have two things, actually three things to talk about. One is the UK variant. And then I, I want to briefly talk about a gene therapy thing that came up just this morning. We don't have to go into it in t too depth, but just so we do something other than SARS-CoV-2 and then we'll do email. And so last time, which was uh, Friday, we talked a bit about this uh, variant of SARS-CoV-2 that has arisen in the UK and it's making some, shall I say, some discussion <laughs> in the world. Oh, that's fair. <laughs> and um, so over the weekend, um, a, a document was released from a committee that I'd never heard of, or an advisory group, I guess it is. Um, and it is uh, called the New and Emerging Respiratory Virus Threats Advisory Group. Had anyone heard of that before? It's news to me. I yeah. had not. But I am not omniscient. Uh, it no. will come as a surprise, <laughs> but I know. But Yeah, so this document, somebody sent it to me. Um, people send to have a lot of stuff. It's great. And uh, so this was sent to me, I think, Sunday. Yeah. Well. I originally saw it from uh, Mike Skinner. I've had uh, like Monday, a, fair right? of, a fair amount of correspondence with uh, Mike, and he's been generous in uh, uh, informing me as to what's going on. Right. I yes, think it, Mike is, it is available on Twitter for people who were wondering. Oh, yeah, I had already, yeah. I had seen it. Yeah, you can find it. Anyway, so we got this, and we didn't discuss it on Friday. So it's basically a meeting where they have a number of members, and all the members are listed, and. Actually, you can find uh, the same members um, on another website, which, yeah, there's a website for nerve tag, and you can find all the members and what they do. Some of them are virologists, some of them are epidemiologists, some of them are immunologists. And it for could be that the reason we haven't heard about this is it's a UK group, and yeah. we're, you know, across an ocean from there. <laughs> and I just recognize Wendy Barclay, who is an influenza virologist. We've had her on TWIV before, and she, we've talked about her work on influenza virus, <clears throat> and then there are others. Anyway, the, the meeting was on December 18th, and it's called Nerve Tag Meeting on SARS-CoV-2 Variant Under Investigation. <clears throat> so this, uh, th this virus, it was originally called VUI, Variant Under Investigation, 20201. 12 slash 01. And those numbers we actually went over last time, they mean things. And I'm glad they call it a variant <laughs> right. under investigation. Right. And, you know, all the people that ask you, is it a strain? Well, well, this come this committee, you know, they, they call it a variant. Uh, so that's cool. And they had reviewed some data and summarized them. And so they reviewed three different documents, uh, this Public Health England document, new evidence on this VUI, and we have a newer Public Health England document we'll go over in a moment. Uh, cycle threshold monitoring data from um, labs, including Oxford, that are monitoring um, diagnostic test results. 
and then uh, a paper called Early Analysis of a Potential Link Between Viral Load and the N501Y Mutation <clears throat> in the SARS-CoV-2 Spike, which I would say the N501 amino acid change in the SARS-CoV-2 Spike. <clears throat> And then they said four analytic pro approaches were reviewed regarding the transmissibility of the virus. The, and the first bullet point is the growth rate from genomic data, which suggests a growth rate of the variant that is 71% higher than other variants. And these are, uh, as far as I understand, uh, sequence reads, um, and, which are used to infer this from patients, right? Um, and then studies of correlation between R values uh, and detection of the variant, which suggests an increase in the R value, the reproductive value between 0.39 to 0.93, which would mean more transmission. And then cycle threshold values, which would suggest a decrease of a cycle threshold of around two, right? So the lower the cycle threshold, the more uh, genomic copies, RNA copies. And I assume that's looking at the, uh, basically the raw data from a given sample. Yeah. And asking for that sample, what was the cycle threshold? It, it is. And one other thing that I've found sort of interesting as I've read about this is it seems as though this particular variant um, has 23 changes, um, some in spike, some in other parts of the genome. Yeah. And one of those changes is a deletion, a short deletion um, in spike. I believe it's 6970. Um, and as a result, the spike PCR uh, primers no longer work yeah. um, that are used for detection. And so one of the ways that they've been monitoring this is looking at people who are testing positive by all of the other primer sets, but who are negative by spike. Um, they've been calling it the spike dropout. Um, so some of these data are genomics data and some of these data are um, sort of diagnostic uh, qPCR data from patients. And then the fourth bullet point is the viral load inferred from uh, genome reads. So they, they're apparently doing a lot of genome sequencing in the UK, more than we're doing here in the US. And they um, can quantify the number of RNA copies that they see in a specimen, right? And they're using that to infer viral load. <clears throat> and from all of this, uh, they conclude, in summary, we have moderate confidence that this variant demonstrates a substantial increase in transmissibility compared to other variants. And they, they suggest more experiments uh, that need to be done to address this. All right. And um, then, um, so, so there, my uh, take on this is that, you know, it's all based on genomic data, PCRs and sequence reads. And that can be misleading, I think, because... Um, I can imagine changes, and there are a lot of changes, as Rianne said, can affect uh, copy number of particular mRNAs um, and, and disperse them. So I, that's why I always say I'd like to see infectivity data from patients, but we never get that, uh, unfortunately. Um, I mean, in the end, the real key is if you think it's increased transmission, then you have to have an idea of how that might happen. And there's more than one way that a virus could become more transmissible. And, and my feeling is you should test it. Although one might argue in the long run, what's the difference? Because we still should do the same non-pharmaceutical interventions, right? That, that we have been yeah, doing well, that's before. The bottom, that's the bottom line is that um, uh, 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 at the current time, dealing with uh, no matter what this is, we deal with it the same way, yeah. I think, right now. Yeah. Okay. yeah. What else can you do? You deal with it the same way and you, and you vaccinate people. We have vaccines now and that's the way to go forward. And a lot of people have been worried that, you know, this means it'll go through their face mask or go, you know, across the room or something like that. People get scared because they don't know how to interpret this, but... I think all the interventions we're doing are are, are sufficient to uh, to deal with it. So I, we've I had think, a lot of discussion. Uh, sorry, Kathy, go ahead. No, go ahead. You finish up. We've had a lot of discussion in the background about this uh, issue of transmission, and um, it has uh, spawned an interest in me. And I would like to hear uh, an epidemiologist talk about transmission. Okay, because I can't do it. All right. Or at least I can't do it from an epidemiological 
uh, perspective. But what does come to mind, what I've been thinking about this morning, is that we use the uh, we use our values all the time. Okay, and if you look it up on Wikipedia, w- Wikipedia, okay, <laughs> it says that uh, our value is a measure of spread. You know, uh, and uh, those measures come from can come, in fact, from genomic data and come from epidemiologic data, okay? So uh, I'd like to hear an epidemiologist sometime talk about this, what yeah, their sure. perspective is. Yeah, because we're not. Yeah. I agree. Yeah, I, I think that <laughs> I've you know heard people talk about this resulting in change in transmission, and I, I feel like, you know, there's this nebulous picture that some people have of what exactly it could be changing or what is going on. And you can imagine lots of things uh, potentially happening in terms of changes in viral load or changes in which part of the nose uh, a virus is replicating in or changes in the number of days one is asymptomatic and potentially spreading or all sorts of things. Um, And that sort of thing we can't necessarily assess from these data. Um, But I think that people who know a whole lot more about genomics than I do um, which doesn't take much, um, <laughs> uh, have been somewhat intrigued by this um, and feel like there is reason for more investigation. And I am always good with more data and more investigation. Kathy, you are going to say something. Yeah. So what I was going to say is that um, Vincent was going through this document from NerveTag, the brief summary of their opinion, and... Uh, so partway through is where it says, in summary, NerveTag has moderate confidence that this variant demonstrates a substantial increase in transmissibility. So they have moderate confidence. Um, and then they go on and talk about the things that, they're, that they don't have enough data about to draw conclusions on. Any kind of underlying mechanism, the age distribution of cases, the disease severity, um, the geographic extent was discussed to some extent, and they uh, endorsed actions proposed by uh, Public Health England and have some additional things. So they are all about getting additional data, which is what where I think we come down also. I have read a lot of things in the popular press and on the interwebs and so forth, and one thing that comes clear to me is what uh, we were just saying about this being something that's perhaps viewed differently by virologists and epidemiologists. And I am fully willing to say that the kind of lineage expansion and phylogenetic trees that people are looking at could point to increased transmissibility. It's not the kind of data that I'm used to evaluating. And there are a couple things I think we'll get to virological.org, but there's a a figure two where they show this cluster of cases from Southeast England and and sort of the rest of their samples. And they have, they're like two disparate graphs because they do uh, their regression analysis on the separate piece of data. And I found that pretty compelling. Couldn't quite tell you how they got to that figure, but the figure itself... uh, looked convincing to me. And so, you know, I think, you know, we could go back to the D614G uh, mutation that was previously thought to perhaps uh, lead to increased transmissibility. And there were a lot of discussions about founder effects and, and that was sort of early on. And so I had this feeling that, you know, maybe founder effects were a factor for D614G. And then subsequently, there was lots of tissue culture work and surrogate viruses and other things that weren't as convincing as we would have wanted. And we still don't have the human data, but but there is some data now from animals about uh, its transmissibility. And it, you know, it looks like there is increased transmissibility for that D614G. Some of the things that I've seen in the last 24 hours about this new variant with all its different mutations, I've seen things about, for instance, neutralization for just uh, with respect to one particular amino acid, the 501. And what I'd really like to see is a comparison of 
you know, maybe the original Washington one isolate WA one, I think that's what it stands for. And, and this thing with all its 23 mutations and, and see some of those comparisons. So anyway, I get, I guess what I wanted to say is that, you know, I think there's a lot of data that we need, but there are some pieces of evidence that may at this point still be circumstantial. So we're just inferring things from them and they're not direct evidence, but we need to pay attention. And that's what a lot of the evolutionary virologists have been quoted as saying in various places where I've read about it. So I would defer to them. So a lot of what we're a lot of what we're going to talk about here is, you know, how do you communicate this? Because I think that's one of the big issues that has come up. And I've been thinking about this in my own way. And I just wanted to give this little image, you know. So you're on nerve tag, the new and emerging respiratory virus threats advisory group. And your job uh, is to advise public health England. Okay. And they tell you, look, we want evidence of any ducks that you can see out there. Okay. And you see this thing and you say, well, geez, it walks like a duck. Okay. But it's little and it's fuzzy and it peeps. It doesn't sound like a duck. What do I do? Okay. Do I tell the boss about this? And how do I tell the boss? And we got to wait and see if this thing grows up, see if it quacks. Okay. And I think they have a responsibility to tell the boss. I don't know how you tell the boss. That's been a problem. Well, the this problem is that the UK prime minister said, got this 71% number. <laughs> and I don't think they should have made that because I, look, I am not opposed to getting more data. No, no problem there. If you've listened to TWIV for the last 12 years, you know that. But I am opposed to making conclusions before you have the data. And to, now I, something's going on here, clearly. And, you know, transmission is a slippery word because, yeah, a virus can transmit rapidly and extensively through a population. But that doesn't mean that the virus is more transmissible. Other things could happen, too. Right. And to blame these appearances on the viral sequence changes, I don't think is correct. And so I think you need a combination of vir viral geneticists and epidemiologists and evolutionary virologists to look at this. And the evolutionary virologists have their perspective, but it's not the only one. You know, they say, oh, this has gone through the population. It's clearly transmitting better. No, it could be a founder effect, as we said earlier. Let's distinguish between them. And so um, I, I do think in their models, they have ways where they are able to do I things like look at founder effects. But again, I, I, I am not an expert enough on that no. to be able to make assessments. And so I, I, I don't think like those to, are. I, I've talked to Nels Eldy about this. And he agrees that those models are not absolutely correct. You can get them to say what you want, unfortunately. And that's the problem with computational biology. You can often get to say whatever you want. And I know they're going to be screaming listening to that, but it's true. And you you have not excluded founder effect from these calculations. Now, um, what was I saying? I was on some kind of a thread. Um, I have this problem. We had D614G. And we said it has increased transmission. And Kathy went through some of the data. You know, in the end, and we went over the, the uh, hamster, it was a hamster or guinea pig data, uh, from, hamster the data hamster from, from the hamster from the Barrick group, which suggested a, a slight increase in transmissibility. And I don't know, 10 hamsters, when you put them in a cage for a couple of days, I don't know what that means for people. And, you know, in the end, it's going to be very hard to extrapolate that. And some virologists are willing to extrapolate it. That's fine. I am not. I want to see some human data. And as I said, you figure out what you think might be the – if it's increased shedding, that could increase transmissibility. Higher concentration per droplet could increase it. As Susan Weiss suggested to me it could be higher – amount of time the virus is spending uh, in the upper tract. I think that's what you need to do to figure it out. Everything else uh, is is indirect. Uh, and then we have, so let's say you, you think D614G 
increases transmissibility. Now we have another set of variants that's increasing transmissibility. I, I think that's very unlikely that this is happening over and over again. It could happen, fine, but that's where my bias comes from. And I think what the problem here is in part the genomic data, which are great to have for contact tracing and seeing where viruses come from. But it, <laughs> you know, you, you see these mutations coming up and people want to say they mean something and they may not. So be very careful because the consequences are you get people scared. And in the end, as we have said, what can you do? The same things you've been doing along, non-pharmaceutical interventions and vaccination. I think scientifically, it's very interesting to know what these changes are doing and why they're arising and so forth. But, you know, the, I feel that the communication aspect of this has not been done well. And people have criticized me for saying, you shouldn't be so negative as a science communicator. And yes, I want to be negative because until you give me the right data, I'm, I'm not sure I buy that. These changes are causing this uh, epidemiological pattern. But we, Rich, we will have a... Um, an epidemiologist on for sure. I think Jeff Shaman would be great to have on to talk about this. And there are other people as well, uh, but they're going to have their own perspective, right? Every, unfortunately, that's the way science is. Everyone has their own perspective. And I think you need everyone uh, to come together to, to make it. And yeah, I, I'm particularly, well, I'm interested in the whole uh, thing, talking to an epidemiologist. I'm particularly interested in this idea of, you know, they're not ignorant of all of the variables that can go into, uh, you know, interpreting uh, what appears to be increased spread. And I'd, I'd be, I'm, I'm interested to hear how yeah, they address sure. those variables and their level of confidence in, in, uh, in the reliability of those uh, techniques. But, you know, there are other things that can be going on to increase transmission in a, in a part of England, right? And these yeah, haven't well, even been brought up. Uh, well, that's... That's one of the problems in the communication because in this document, they don't talk about any of that stuff. I have to assume yeah. that the people who are doing the analysis, okay, are taking into account stuff like founder effect and other things that they aren't just looking at raw data when they do their uh, computations. But it's not in the document, okay? I assume will, and these aren't scientific papers, okay? These are uh, reports of deliberations that people have had. So I assume we'll see that down the road, but I don't know. We don't have that at this point. Yeah, I, I mean, I'm, I'm actually really struck um, as I hear uh, what Vincent is saying about the fact that we need to, you know, remember there's more than one kind of communication going on here. Um, I, as I said, I'm not a genomics person. Um, I, and in some level, I you know, am deferring to some of their evolutionary virology expertise. And some of the questions we're asking are questions of what I would love to have them communicate to me. Um, and so communication you know, between the scientists. And so I want to know those nitty gritty details of how they figure out details of founder effect and how, I think that would be fascinating. Um, but we also have to focus on how we communicate this to non-scientists who may hear this and worry about whether or not there are going to be changes in whether they should wear their mask or whether this vaccine is going to suddenly not work or things like that. And I think we have some information that we can communicate to those individuals, um, even though, yes, I would love to learn more about the background of how you get this model. Well, I can tell you that some uh, evolutionary biologists say, yeah, that's the mutations are doing this. They won't, they won't consider alternative hypotheses. That's what they, you know, that's what I was saying before. Everyone has their own way of looking at things. And I want all of us to get together and say, you know, what's going on, but that's not how it's happening. And, uh, I, <laughs> Yeah. So uh, uh, with uh, actually this uh, in terms of communication, this 71 percent number is good because the first time I saw that was in the press, that this thing has a 71 percent higher growth rate. And I thought, what the heck does that mean? OK. And I'm sure and I'm pretty well informed. And I'm sure that a lot of other people s said, oh, either either what the heck does that mean? That's uh, probably oh, most bad. of them said, oh, that's terrible. Yeah, OK. Right. <laughs> and, but I'm, you know, I don't fault the scientists for relating this to the public health officials or even to the prime minister or the minister of parliament. Okay. Cause those, you would have to say, okay, look, what we do is we compare the amount of this this week and the amount last week, we take the ratio of that. 
and that gives us a number. And its number, it's consistently over the past few weeks, 1.71, or that's the average, okay? That relates to a 71% increase, and that's bigger than we typically see with non-synonymous, I'm making this part up, non-synonymous um, uh, changes in the virus, okay? And so that makes us think that maybe there's something going on here, okay? Uh, and then, you know, it becomes... The, the MPs, you have to impress on the MP or whoever is going to take it further down the road uh, that, you know, these are preliminary data, okay, and this is what it means. And I would go to, uh, in Fauci, I trust. So I went back and replayed his, for myself, his interview with Judy Woodruff on the PBS NewsHour two days ago. And I'll just read part of it. We can do the whole thing later if you want. But this is how he parsed that. He said, this, uh, I, my word is variation, okay? I forget exactly what his word was, but it, in the context, it didn't quite work. This variation has a suggestion that it might allow the virus to spread more readily. A suggestion that it might allow, uh, allow the virus to spread more readily. And he says, got to keep an eye on it. You don't just want to blow it off. And then he talks about, he talked about how it's not going to change the uh, uh, vaccine protocol. It's not going to probably change the immunity. There's no indication it's going to change the pathogenesis. Okay. We still got to do all the same stuff. Okay. But we're going to pay attention. That's yeah, how that's I think he's good at that. That's fine. You know? yeah. yeah. That's right. But I, agree. I listened is, to that too. It's when good. you go, when uh, the, this uh, this nerve tag committee gave this to the prime minister, or what's the point? Like, what are you going to do? He he shuts down whatever he did. I don't know, but is that the right uh, response? I mean, if you're doing the NPIs, you don't have to change anything. Now, if he thought the, maybe this is an excuse to get people to pay attention, that's a different story, and I can't the, talk to that, right? Yeah, there's there's a, a history of <laughs> Boris Johnson being a procrastinator at making the tough decisions. For example, the trade deal with respect to Brexit. He's been dragging his feet for months, if not years, on this. And a, a parallel was made that he should have said something sooner about shutting down for Christmas. And he didn't and procrastinated. And then this report came along. And you could say, well, he found his scapegoat. Let's blame it on this virus variant. And that's how we do it. So there's a there's communication at that level as well that sure, sure, uh, sure. we have to consider. So I think everybody, or, you know, most people will agree that this has, you know, uh, sp spread... <laughs> Uh, for lack of a better term, <laughs> like a virus, uh, this this news has really, um, you know, but it's been inflammatory. It hasn't been very well uh, propagated in a lot of media. There have been some articles, and there was a really good feature, a short feature on on NPR yesterday that was good. That are balanced and basically describe you know what Rich said that Fauci said. We don't have to be concerned right now about vaccines. We don't have to be concerned right now about pathogenesis. Is this something we should watch for the future? And if we do the same things we've been doing, don't travel, wear masks, wash your hands, physically distance, those are all going to work for this virus as well. I mean, you know, I think people are afraid in, in London to go outside of their house now because, I mean, even to their front porch just because, yeah, you know, there's this yeah. new virus. And, and that kind of messaging That's the problem, yeah. is, is a problem. <laughs> yeah, because if they're masking and distancing and all that, as they should be, this is not an issue. And right. in fact, you know, I think the genomics are great to have. But there was a time when we didn't have genomics like this and the virus has spread. We made vaccines and that was the end of it. And one can argue that that's what we're doing here. And this is really of, of little overall impact. You know, the D614G, I don't know what difference that made. To, the virus is going to spread globally either way. Uh, and this one, the same. I really think that the, there's little contribution. I think from a 
virological viewpoint, it's interesting to know why these emerge and why they propagate and so forth. But on a practical level, I, I don't think uh, there's a lot you can do now. If it evaded antibody responses and it got more pathogenic, there's no evidence for that. And we'll, we'll go through a little bit of that in, in a bit. But um, I just, on two levels, I think this has been problematic. First, I don't think uh, the, the claims, the 71% are warranted of increased transmission. And secondly, that so does it matter in the end, right? I'm not sure it does. Uh, yes, it's a communication issue. I agree. And I always take the opposite view, which is I have to try and temper uh, what the press is doing. And, you know, I talked to a lot of reporters yesterday about this. And I'm trying to say, look, you have to make sure the data support what you're saying. And so far, and I think it do not. And other people can have different views. That's fine. But we all have to talk. And, um, you know, I agree that we need to do more. I want to just... Uh, I decided the other day that, in fact, uh, uh, given in particular the number of uh, mutations, that this was an encrypted message from Mother Nature <laughs> telling, us, <laughs> telling us to get our act together. You know, because there's all this panic and then people are saying, oh, don't travel, don't... Uh, uh, duh. Yeah, you're not right? supposed to travel. <laughs> it's not what news. are you doing traveling to start with? <laughs> yeah. People say, oh, it's ruining my Christmas. Really? Just this one is ruining? Or was yeah. it the whole <laughs> pandemic? Yeah. I, I just, this idea of the genomic era, right? I, I was talking to some people. Does this happen in HIV? I said to some people. And they said, no, that was the 80s. We didn't have much genomics back then, you know, the virus spread and there was none of this. And, and I love my favorite story, and sorry if you've heard this before, you know, polio virus, paralytic polio from thousands of years ago to about 1900, there was a case here, there was a case there, right? We call that endemic poliomyelitis. Then all of a sudden around 1900s, early 1900s, it became epidemic. You started having these outbreaks, right? And this is 1900, nobody has sequencing, nobody really understands who the virus is to begin with. And they do some, what Michael Schmidt would call uh, shoe leather epidemiology, and they figure out, well, what happened around 1900, sanitation improved so that kids weren't being infected in their first month of life. And when you get the virus in your first month, your mother's antibodies that you've got from her protect you. So now we delay infection, and now we have groups of kids who don't have maternal antibodies anymore, and boom, outbreaks of polio. Perfect, right? Beautiful, makes sense of public health and epidemiology. And I always say if we had genome sequencing, they would immediately blame it on the mutation. They would find some changes that occurred as the virus went through the population. Ah, this is making it epidemic. So that's all I'm asking is just to look further than what the bases are telling you, because it may not be the whole story. Although, you know, I'm, I mean, look, I was one of the first people to sequence a virus genome. OK, I get it. I get why it's cool, but it doesn't answer everything uh, every time. And it's just what I want people to do is to think about it and uh, look at it in a, in a broader context. Does that make sense? Sure. Mm -hmm. When you guys are quiet, I get suspicious because, you know. <laughs> <laughs> We're thinking. That's why I always nope. ask you, okay? Is that good? All right. Um, then there, there's two other, two other uh, things we can – so first of all, we'll put a link to NerveTag, the website, so you can find – oh, this is where the biographies of everyone are and their interests and so forth. So that's quite nice. We'll put a link to that so you can see that. Um, and then there are two documents. Uh, one is from Virological. It, and we've, uh, we have talked about Virological documents before. This is a website run, I think, by Andrew Rambeau, who, which uh, I don't remember the context of SARS-CoV-2. I think it was having to do with the origin of the virus originally. He, he had written some interesting articles. So now there's an article, Preliminary Genomic Characterization of This Virus. And the authors of this are also on the uh, nerve tag document. That makes me nervous when I say nerve tag. <laughs> <laughs> nerve tag. Um, and then there is um, another document from Public Health England, which actually has a lot of the same information. I, I read both of them and, and uh, I said these are similar, but I just want to go through the PHE one. I don't know why. 
but you guys can can jump in and, and tell me other things. So the PHE document is a nice history of what's going on here. You know, when it was first picked up, this was December 8th, not too long ago in Kent. They started to pick up this uh, unusual um, variant, okay? Uh, and then it was called a VOC originally, variant of concern, which uh, was then- I think it's the other way around. I'm sorry, V variant under investigation. Yeah, yeah, VUI. And then it was changed to a variant of concern of VOC (laughs) later after they got the data that we've just uh, told you about. They got concerned about it. Um, And they go through the PCR test, which Brianne has told you. They use spike primers, and this one, because of the deletion mutation in the genome, the, the PCR doesn't work. So it's a negative S gene target. So they say we use the frequency of S gene target negatives among PCR positives as a proxy for frequency of this variant. And they mentioned that the further back in time you go, the less valuable that is because there are other variants that also test negative uh, on the spike. Um, And then they go through this calculation, which um, Rich has already mentioned um, uh, using PCR, which they say yields a measure of the transmission fitness relative to, to pre-existing strains. And that's one of the bits of data they use to uh, say there is an increase in transmission fitness and then how they use this to find this higher reproduction number. Um, there's they this, call uh, it uh, estimated epidemic growth rates. Yeah. Okay. And uh, in fact, there's a there's a, a, a disconnect for me between this. This is the calculation that I quoted. And then in another document, they talk about 71% increase, okay? I'm putting those two together. They don't say in this document that that's the calculation they used to come to 71%. I'm making that assumption because it's the the best I can do. Yeah, I think that's right. Um, Then they they have a section on genomic characteristics, as we mentioned, 23 mutations, 13 non-synonymous, which means they cause an amino acid change four deletions and six synonymous mutations. And there are quite a few in the spike, but there are also quite a few in ORF1AB, which haven't gotten much attention. Poor RNA polymerase, just ignored. <laughs> <laughs> spike gets all the attention, but you know we don't know what these do. And there's also one in the M gene. Uh, but you know changes in the polymerase can affect RNA levels. And so I have no problem saying, ah, maybe these changes are making more RNA and that's why the PCR is different, right? So I think you need to sort all that out and and, and be careful. So there's a nice table which shows you all these changes, ORF1AB spike. The other change is in ORF8. And one of them makes a stop code on which truncates the protein. ORF8 is a protein encoded in the right-hand part of the genome, which we've talked about before. We actually talked about it way back at the beginning of this year. Because I had heard Christian Drosten the previous year at a meeting in Rotterdam talk about an orphate deletion in SARS, the first SARS in 2003. Very interesting. It emerged about halfway through the outbreak. Remember, it was only 8,000 people or so, smaller, much smaller. And then for the rest of the outbreak, all the isolates from everyone had an orphate deletion. And Drosten's idea was that this actually made the virus less pathogenic, and consequently more transmissible. So that's very interesting. Here we go. If it's less pathogenic, you're you're more likely to be walking around and transmitting. So it's not a direct effect on virus production in transmission, right? It's an indirect effect. So the, the point is that transmission can be affected in different ways. Of course, that was a hypothesis, hard to prove, but these orphate deletions have arisen in the SARS-CoV-2 outbreak, one originally in Singapore and subsequently other countries. We talked about a Lancet paper not too long ago where the clinical presentation in people with the orphate deletion seems to be milder than in people with an orphate intact. You know, again, I that needs to be further explored, but this isn't getting any uh, attention whatsoever. It's not spike. Anything but spike the doesn't seem to get much attention. I think yeah, that's a very I, interesting mutation. I, I think all of this is incredibly important um, because there is there are data out there on some of these mutations individually, like this ORF8 mutation, like N501Y and Spike. Um, 
And I know that that was one thing that was sort of confusing to me when I started reading a bit about this is that there also was some discussion in the media of an N501Y uh, containing variant being found in South Africa and discussion of what that meant. And that was sort of brought into some of the, the media discussions on the first day of this this weekend. Um, but we haven't seen these 23 mutations together. We know a little bit about one or another in isolation, um, but one of the things that will be of interest is actually looking at all of these mutations together and how they may work. The um, yeah, there there are several in the spike, and this 501 N501Y, asparagine 501 to tyrosine, has gotten some attention, and I want to come back to that in a moment. Um, and then there's some there's deletions in the spike, as you know, and there's also an amino acid change near the furin site, which we know the furin site cleavage site is important, but we don't know what this change does. Uh, they say something is quite interesting. So they say similar to Danish cluster five. What is Danish cluster five? Is that a cookie? Sounds <laughs> sounds good, tasty. It is the viruses that went into mink. And changed because you go and virus goes into a new host. It changed. And remember, there were a number, what was it, five changes in, in that particular isolate where it was thought to abrogate uh, neutral or reduce neutralization with uh, human convalescent sera. And that was a concern, of course, because a you know, virus goes into a new host. And you know what? Humans are not all the same. So when a virus goes into people in Kent, England, they may be slightly different from everyone else. And that's why the virus diversifies and so forth. Um, anyway, they say um, the idea here is that it may suggest that the virus has replicated under different selection pressures because the virus going into mink is a different selection pressure, right? And what about in people? People are not the same. And they say, well, maybe an immunocompromised patient, right? And they say there's a recent case report of an immunocompromised patient persistently infected with SARS-CoV-2 acquiring 10 mutations in spike over 154 days. Is that the Michigan report, uh, Kathy, that we did? Um, I Might be, right? I, the one from Adam Loring. I don't remember the number of mutations and the time But there were, span. it was uh, many days of uh, reproduction. Right. And including N501Y, right? So this emerged in an immunocompromised patient. And so there's a theory, which is also on the virological.org, that may be... This originated in an immunocompromised patient or maybe in people receiving convalescence era. Who knows, right? But just, just the idea that everybody's the same is wrong to think that. And that's why variants emerge in different parts of the world because people are diverse. They're diverse condi conditions. Now, 501 is quite interesting, the residue. Um, it's, it's at the contact site of spice with ACE2. And it's been seen before, as we said. Um, and so there's, you know, some suggestion that maybe this is increasing receptor binding affinity and that increases transmission. And I just think that's a, about as big a leap that you can make without any data, right? You need, because remember when this virus first arose, they said, oh, the, the spike has incredibly high affinity, more than we would have ever predicted for ACE2. And now you're saying it's getting higher and that's increasing transmission. I don't think that makes any sense, right? Um, so you can do experiments to address that, but to, to speculate doesn't seem to make sense to me. But what's interesting about N501Y is that um, if you remember, uh, the Barrett group took SARS-CoV-2 and adapted it to efficiently infect mice using mouse ACE2. And the Two amino acids in spike that do that are 499 and 500, right next to 501. So it's right at that interface. Okay, so this, there's some suggestion that this may be influencing uh, ACE2 interaction. But there, there was some concern that this change might impact um, vaccine efficacy. It's at an antigenic site, but I don't think that 501 Y I don't think is a concern. Um, there's a paper from September where they had, they passaged SARS-CoV-2 in mice intranasally and they end up with N501Y and they show that when they immunize mice with just purified receptor binding domain protein, 
challenge with uh, N501Y infection is blocked by the antibodies against the wild type protein. So I, I, I mentioned that yesterday. And then Theodora Hatsuanu told me, yes, we looked at that variant in our paper. It's in eLife where they went through every variant they could find and checked to see their reactivity with monoclonal antibodies. And N501Y does not change reactivity with a monoclonal directed at that site. So I'm not worried about that in terms of vaccine response. Of course, there are other changes as well that may be an issue. Yeah, so I think there's one other thing that's really important to talk about in terms of vaccines. Um, so as Vincent just mentioned, um, the paper that he talked about and the responses they were discussing were in response to a monoclonal antibody. Um, when Not um, the mouse one. The mouse one from okay. China from September is, is a polyclonal response. Okay, so the, the important piece I wanted to bring up is exactly that, um, a polyclonal response. Um, when you uh, get a vaccine... Um, say your spike mRNA vaccine, um, it will contain, it will encode the entire spike protein. You will make the entire spike protein and spikes a pretty big protein. So you will be making B cell antibody responses and T cell responses to many different portions of that spike protein, many different epitopes. Um, and I, I don't remember where I saw this number um, now, given the read, all the things I have read, um, but I saw something about the idea that perhaps Spike might contain 20 epitopes. Yeah, Alessandro Sette had told me that the other day, yeah. Um, and I feel like, you know, perhaps there could be one of these mutations might change the response to one of those epitopes, but you would still have the other 19 um, making good responses and allowing for protection. And so given the, that size of spike and the number of epitopes that it contains, I'm not as worried about one of these particular mutations removing all vaccine-induced immunity. Yeah, one of the things I read was somebody saying, you know, there's lots of guns or lots of ammunition that the immune system has that's pointing at this. And so it it's not something that we need to worry about. And those um, are it, just the, that's just the B cell response. Okay. Right. There are T cell right. epitopes as well. And right. it, see, it seems to me that the experiment, if you want to do an experiment to see if this has an effect, what you have to do is uh, check for reactivity. You have to make a pseudotype virus or something like that with this in it. And you have to check for its neutralization by convalescent serum or serum from people who have been vaccinated, depending right. on what population mm -hmm. you want to look at. And you can't just do one person, you have to do a bunch, because different people are going to yeah. have different responses. Yeah. So it's a big experiment, okay? And uh, what I understand is that that's in progress, right? They're doing that in the UK with this variant. Um, so we'll know. But just to be clear, this paper that I mentioned in from September, this Amy had given this to me the other day, um, they immunize mice with purified receptor binding domain of spike, right? So then the mice make a polyclonal response and they infect them with the variant N, you know, uh, N501Y and the variant reproduction is blocked by that polyclonal response. So that one change is not a concern in a poly polyclonal response, okay? Uh, in this document, continuing in this NHE document, then there's an interesting uh, graph showing the portion of positive tests with this S dropout, right, over time. And it's a graph showing date. It goes from June to December. And the S dropout, again, being in, in this month, at least, this variant with the deletion in the spike gene. And you can see over time, they're just blips, you know, less than 0.1 fraction of total tests little blips, blips. And then between August and September, there was a different deletion that arose, but then it went back down in October, went up and then down. And then at the beginning of, uh, it looks like end of November, beginning of December, again, it goes all the way up and they have a, goes up to 0.7, which is almost one, I guess. And then there's a table breaking it down by weeks. A percent of the variant, which is lacking this, these amino acids and spike, it goes from 5% in, October 12th to 96% on November 30th. So this obviously is increasing in, in prevalence, right? That's a percent of the new variant in all of Delta 6970. 
So I don't think yeah. that's all of the viruses. No. I think that's what percentage of the dropouts Table are this two. variant. Okay. Okay, yes. That goes yes. up to 96%. Got it, got okay, it. Okay, but the graph that you pointed to on the top, Is I all. think... That's all that. So that table is just saying at this point in time, 96% of the dropouts are this variant. Okay. So you right. can use, put that in your head while you're looking at this table that shows right. the S dropouts and shows that it goes up to 0.7. Okay? The, the, Those the are graph, basically all going to be the variant. Right. And the graph says about 70% of positive tests have this dropout. And right. then of those, 96% are the actual right. variant. So it's, it's right. a lot, right? Yeah, it's a lot. And that's in a, I don't know what, um, for the graph, I don't know exactly what area this is because this is regional, okay? Uh, there are so, some, there are hot spots for this going on, okay? Yeah. It's not yeah. everywhere. Yeah, yeah. All right, so they conclude uh, we have this novel variant. It's spread rapidly. We have assessed as having substantially increased transmissibility with high confidence. Further studies are underway. I think, so my view is that the transmissibility is based on the genomic characterization, which I don't think is appropriate, but you can have your idea. Um, Amy reminded, we have a Slack channel. She reminded us that PCR, LAMP, RNA sequence, et cetera, none of those can determine the speed at which a virus can re replicate or reproduce, which I would agree with. But I think we need to look at it. I'm not saying we don't. I just don't think you can make conclusions based uh, just on those data. Um, and does anyone? I think these this, the things that are in that document are pretty much the same as the uh, virological document. So uh, yeah, you, there's a lot of overlap amongst these, among other things, because they're you know some of the people are the same and that yeah, kind of stuff. Yeah. They're, they're, one of these documents went into real detail. Uh, almost down to uh, supposing a, 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 an index case about this idea that it was an immune-compromised individual. More <laughs> detail than I think was in that one, and I can't... I think that's the uh, virological I three, one. I got three or four documents here, and I can't yeah. find it again, but somewhere. And it's, an it's all speculative, or it's mostly speculative, yeah. but it's an interesting yeah. rap. The, the two <laughs> documents, rap. to me, the, the Public Health England document is less referenced um, yeah, yeah, that's throughout. Right. And they have a supporting figure um, at the end that's a bunch of graphs by region. And they're looking at the incidence over time. And even if you blow it up, it's illegible. But uh, <laughs> they at least tell you in the legend what the colors mean. But if you look at the, at the graphs, there are some over time where the um, y-axis measure, which is uh, something number of cases, I think it says. Anyway, um, that it, that they're decreasing, but in in the regions where the cases are staying flat or even increasing, they have a higher proportion of blue uh, bars within these graphs, and the blue bars are the S G negative. In other words, the dropout. In other words, that's their surrogate marker for one of these variants. It's their Rather than sequencing the whole genome, if they get this result by PCR, they're assuming that it has this this uh, variation with this deletion in it. And those where there's it's staying flat or increasing, those are the ones where there's more of this blue colored graph in it. So so that's one thing that's different. Um, the The other document uh, is much more referenced. It's much more like a scientific paper, um, almost like a, a preprint. And as I was saying earlier, this is the one where they show the phylogenetic tree with the three uh, lineages that really stood out for this one uh, portion that caught everybody's eye. They kind of went, whoa, um, and I have to take their word for it. But then, and these are all open access, uh, the figure two that shows this regression analysis um, across the x-axis is date of collection from January, uh, March, yeah, okay, uh, up through, okay, it, it goes to January of this year, but there's no data out there, so I thought I was a little confused. Okay, it ends, the data end in November. And then on the y-axis is the average per site genetic divergence from root. 
and they have like these two different lines. It's very striking. I, um, I'm not sure I'm capable of doing screen sharing, but uh, it's really worth taking a look at. And that's that's what caught my eye that um, these these two sets of data and this upper set for the lineage of this variant, which is known as B.1.1.7, uh, the variant of concern, it is a different cluster of data points. And that really, I think, is eye-catching. So that's, so, to me, the difference between the two documents. Uh, one other thing I want to uh, point out uh, is this uh, link that, um, and I've only just begun to look at this, this link that uh, uh, Mike Skinner sent me this morning to a site called MicroReact, mm -hmm. uh, which yeah, is, yeah. Uh, what do they, hang on, what do they, they call themselves Open Data Visualization and Sharing for Genomic Epidemiology. Uh, this has been developed by the Center for Genomic Pathogen Surveillance at Imperial College and the Welcome uh, Genome Campus, and it has a bunch of they, you know, it has a bunch of credible uh, support and et cetera. And if you look on their front page, uh, they have several projects going on that you can look at. One of which is SARS-CoV-2 in the UK, and if you click on that, it gives you a display of what I presume are the primary data. Uh, for all of this, all these reads, okay? Now, I haven't been able to make my way through this, uh, but there's uh, uh, a bar chart on the bottom uh, that where if you hover over it, you can uh, identify individual uh, variants, I believe, that um, comprise the read load on a given uh, date, uh, and uh, I believe you can get from that some idea of the proportion that we've already summarized of this variant in it. But I just point this out because, uh, like I say, I've just started to look at it, but um, it strikes me as if you really want to see the raw data, a resource that at least gets you into that. All right, we'll put all these links in, and you can spend your holiday uh, checking them out. <laughs> <laughs> That's what you want to do, yeah. right? <laughs> yeah, it's interesting because, as Rich uh, pointed out when he sent us this email, it, it calls the lineage B.1.177. And the science article uh, that came out on December 20th made a big point that that variant is not the same as the B.1.1.7. So I'm not sure where the truth falls for that, but... Yeah, like I said, I've just started looking at this, and I'm, uh, I don't know quite how to use the data. I just wanted to point it out because it's there. Uh, yes. The variant is 2020121, <laughs> right? That's the variant. I think that's a lineage, the B dot. Isn't that a lineage? Yeah, it does say lineage. So um, it's, yeah, so the variant has got the VUI number or VOC. The, the, right. The D dot or the lineage. 2020121, yeah. 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 Um, one, one final, well, not really. <laughs> one more thing. One other. <laughs> one other thing. Ricarda sent us a rough summary of an interview with our GCG, German Corona Guru, not his official title, <laughs> uh, which she gave to National Radio on Monday. And, and she, tr so she translated it, I guess. And we'll put her transcription in uh, like how worried are you I'm not overly worried but you know UK scientists have said they'll need a week for detailed data analysis so this is Monday uh, what are the most important questions is it easier to transmit we have this virus in the southeast of London, England, including London. The question is, has it been noticed in the wake of a new rise of cases in the region or has the virus caused the rise exactly exactly that that's the question uh, the area where the virus was found had experienced exponential growth in December, whereas in other regions which had been in lockdown numbers were beginning to stabilize. What about the statement that the variant is 70% more transmissible? Uh, and he said, who knows, maybe a, a scientist was asked to give an estimate, which then developed a life of its own, which I thought was amusing. But we know, as, as Rich has noted here, it came from the nerve tag summary. Mm -hmm. And, you know, one of the things that bothers me about this number, they call it growth rate from genomic data. You know, as a virologist, 
that ain't gross, right? <laughs> I want to see a single step growth curve. Then you can talk about growth rate. But we're using different languages, right? Yeah, there's <laughs> lots of vocabulary problems here and uh, that are aggravated by talking across disciplines. Yeah. And then Neil Ferguson, Kathy put in a quote of Neil Ferguson by Zimmer, Carl Zimmer. And he's one of the authors on this uh, nerve tag document and, and the next org. He's on the committee, Neil Ferguson. And he said 50 to 70 percent increased transmission rate. Um, and then, she, then he was asked about closing their borders. Uh, considering all the things we already know about the virus, it would be surprising if, oh, wait a minute, I'm, I'm jumped ahead. Excuse me. He, he's back to transmission. He didn't even answer the question about closing the borders. <laughs> if you want to know whether a virus is easier to transmit, you have to examine pairs of transmission, who infected whom and how long did it take. An epidemiological parameter called serial interval. Yeah. Um, so uh, uh, Fauci did address the closing the borders thing. Uh -huh. The question from Judy Woodruff uh, was she asked him specifically about closing the borders in the U.S. Okay, so that could be a different thing. But I thought his answer, Fauci is so good at this. I thought his answer was great. He said, I think that would be premature. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I what agree. a beautiful word for the situation. Yes. Yes. Premature. Agreed. All right. Um, so then he's asked, do you reckon it's not more transmissible? I don't know. I'm keeping an open mind. And that's that's fine. There's some properties that are worrying. A mutation in the receptor binding domain that appeared before has vanished. It appeared now in South Africa, seems to have passed on, but no one knows whether it has any effect. It increases the binding to the receptor, but this doesn't need to be a good thing. The virus needs to be able to get off, get, let go of the receptor at some stage. Um, and then he says the virus has spent a lot of time trying to sort things out, which I don't, you know, it's evolving. I'm doubtful this mutation is actually beneficial. Will it be possible to stop this variant from coming to Germany? I reckon it's already here. <laughs> yeah, it's probably all over the place. I, I wanna, go ahead, Kathy. I was just going to say, I want to insert here, uh, again, in this uh, Public Health England document, the graph with the yellow and gray bars and the, and the blue parts. There are blue parts in every region of England, so Yorkshire, other places. And so while it's clustered in the southeast of England, Kent and uh, Anglia and so forth, it's it's already all over yeah. England. And yeah. it would be a big surprise if it weren't in Germany and the US. I mean, an interesting thing will be to say, did something unusual go on in Kent or wherever this virus goes, is it going to take over? And we'll see that in the next few weeks. Exactly. And, I think right? that's going to be one of the most interesting things. Although people have said that, you know, genomic sequencing is not great everywhere. And, you know, the UK is very good, but apparently the US is not as good. And, you know, Trevor Bedford would take umbrage, but, you know, you're doing a good job, but not the rest of the country. Um I know in well, New York they've uh, maybe, started an initiative to do this, so we'll we'll know. Maybe a sequela of this, another uh, silver lining to this cloud will be that everybody will ramp up their genomic sequencing capability. Yeah. That, we'll talk about it next year. It's enough for this year. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I should never say that. Uh, what about the vaccine? Could it reduce efficiency? No, I don't see that at the moment. We make a lot of antibodies after vaccination, as we have said already, so I'm not worried about that either. So I like that CGC. GCG. GCG used to be a sequence package that we used to use for uh, yes. analysis. Right? I have used you it. Yes. You yes. did. You're too young. I no, did. how could you use it? <laughs> really? I, I might have been an undergrad when I used it, but I did use it. Yeah, that, that was, I used, was it? I used, to, I used to be the guy at Buffalo who yeah. got all the tapes from the different databases yeah. and reformatted them so that they could be used in a single platform. Jeez. Wow. Now, from my base, from my basement on my Mac Plus. Yeah, they used to be on a wow. tape. I remember that. Um, was the GCG package was that Roger Stodden? I, uh, you know, I uh, I forget. Uh, um, was it also this uh, the same as the Wisconsin package? I think of GCG and Wisconsin as being the same thing. I think, but they might I not think be. basically both of both of those packages used this uh, Stodden shotgun assembly uh, platform. Okay. Yeah. Uh, sorry, folks, for that little uh, nerdy di digression. Oh, as if the whole thing ain't nerdy, right? <laughs> 
Now, Rich, you put this Drosten tweet in. What's going on there? New data uh, that just, don't look uh, good? Just an update. This actually uh, came to me again from Mike, uh, where he pointed out a quote from a Guardian article uh, just this morning where the Guardian, <laughs> the Guardian quotes a tweet from Drosten that says, <laughs> quote, new data on the B.1.1.7 uh, mutant published today. Unfortunately, it doesn't look good. On the positive side, cases with the mutant have so far only increased in areas where the overall incidence was higher rising. Contact reduction also works against the spread of the mutant. Okay, that's just an update on uh, Drosten's I don't think uh, that's the name of the mutant, things. though. I think that's the lineage, right? Yeah, but that's, but that's how people are the, sort of using the, them interchangeably yeah. as All mutant right. okay. and lineage. Got it. Yeah. And as long as we're at it, I want to uh, read, read, give Fauci his full due. Yeah, yeah, okay? go ahead. Uh, this is because, like, uh, plus I did work on this, so I wrote this down <laughs> at midnight. Midnight last night, I reviewed the tape. <laughs> uh, it's something that we want to keep an eye on. You don't want to just blow it off. This variation, my word variation, has a suggestion that it might allow us, might allow the virus to spread more easily. We're still seeking out evidence to prove or disprove that. It's something you take seriously. You keep your eye on it. You do tests to determine whether there is more functional relevance than we seem to believe that there is. That last bit is a little crumbly, okay? But uh, generally, he's saying, you know, pay attention, okay? Uh, you know, update at 11. And he went on, as I said, to talk about how it's really of no consequence right now as we've already discussed, in terms of pathogenicity or uh, immunity and the measures you take to deal with it are all the same. Yeah, in fact, when people ask me, should I worry? I say, no, just do the same things you're doing. And if you haven't been, why not? Uh, yeah, you ought to worry. There's a pandemic going on. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. <laughs> so wear your mask. That's right. Okay. Uh, finally, there's a thing from the WHO published a notice which someone put in, and so I took the liberty of excerpting from it. They write, all viruses change, but most do, mutations do not have a direct benefit to the virus or, or det detrimental to its propagation. Further lab investigations are required to fully understand the impact of specific mutation of viral properties. These re investigations take time. The prelimin This is interesting. The preliminary findings by the UK signal the broader issue of SARS-CoV-2 mutations, and WHO underscores the importance of prompt sharing of epidemiological, virological, and full genome sequence information with other countries through open source platforms such as GISAID and others. So that's really important. I mean, as we've said, we need to do more sequencing and share it. And they want us to do more. They want more studies done. And then they end, it's important to remember the principles to reduce general risk of transmission. They go through everything we've talked about, close contact avoidance, hand washing, you know, look for symptoms, distance control, et cetera, wearing masks. So in the end, if you say, should I worry? Yeah, there's a pandemic and do all these things that we've been <laughs> telling you, right? Mm -hmm. But that's what everyone wants to know. I've gotten a mm -hmm. hundred email for, to, should I worry about this? Well, if, if you're not worried for all of 2020, maybe it's about time yeah, it's to get a, worried. Read the encrypted message. Well, maybe nature, maybe right? uh, people are thinking the vaccine's not going to work, but I, I really don't think that's going to be an issue. Yeah, the, the pandemic's already bad, and this might make it incrementally, a tiny bit incrementally, yeah. a little bit worse. But In some places, yeah. maybe. Yeah. You know, <laughs> I, and I tell you, with all, there are a lot of bad things that have happened, and I'm not saying this is one of them, but the pandemic has fundamentally changed this podcast. You know, we used to talk about all kinds of things. Now we've done the same topic pretty much for almost a year. It's really unusual. Mm -hmm. Twice um, a week. Yeah. It's really amazing. Actually, when you consider Daniel three times a week. Yeah. I'm not sure that's all good. I mean, people have certainly benefited. But um, anyway, that's just a kind of random thing there. But there is one other non-SARS-CoV-2 news I wanted to point out. And I guess this is because I'm feeling bad that what we talk about is SARS-CoV-2. And this is only this is just an article by Jocelyn Kaiser in Science 
Um, liver tumor and gene therapy recipient raises concerns about virus widely used in treatment. So apparently there, there is a, um, in a, in a gene therapy trial, a hemophilia patient injected with a virus carrying a therapeutic gene has developed a liver tumor. So the FDA has halted the trials and the Dutch firm behind the studies has investigated whether the virus itself caused the cancer. And the, the virus is adeno-associated virus, uh, which is carrying, um, I guess, the factor nine gene in this case, right? Uh, to treat the hemophilia. And Gene therapy experts say it's unlikely the patient had underlying conditions that predisposed him to liver cancer, but they have to rule out roles for the virus, AAV. And so I, I looked back uh, at AAV, which we've talked about, adeno-associated virus. And this is a, vec a very common vector because you get long-term uh, transgene expression after putting it in people. And one has been approved already for treating blindness. To, you know, it's the virus is injected into the retina and it supplies a gene that's missing and people can see again. It's really quite remarkable. So I'm thinking, how did this virus cause cancer? I guess one way it could integrate uh, near or within an oncogene, right? Or a gene which if overproduced, uh, overexpressed, I can say overexpressed for a gene, <laughs> If overexpressed, um, could cause transformation of the cell. And so I looked up, here's what it says in Principles of Virology. AAV genomes can integrate into the host cell genome in cells infected in the absence of a helper virus, but this process requires the viral rep proteins that are not made in AAV vector infected cells. One of the greatest virtues of these vectors for gene therapy is the persistence of the genomes of, as episomes in non-dividing cells. This property, which was not anticipated, is the result of intra- or intermolecular recombination among vector sequences to form circles or circular concatomers. Uh, AAV vector genomes cannot be replicated in the absence of viral proteins. Consequently, the delivery of multiple copies of the vector genome to each target cell will increase the likelihood that episomes will be formed from them. These episomes can persist and support expression of the transduced genes for years in non-dividing cells. So it's really cool that that's why it's persistent in the absence of integration. Now, what does this have to do with what I just told you? So I don't know the likelihood that this would integrate in uh, in a patient. It's not supposed to do that, right? And so- I would I'm say a, that uh, my, my guess would be that uh, uh, it's unlikely that it's not something that the virus was, uh, it's not part of the way that this vector works. But man. cells are stupid, right? And if they see <laughs> DNA, they'll say, oh, DNA, I know where that goes. And they'll stuff it in their genome, okay? And so you could knock out an anti-oncogene or, or something like that, I suppose. But with all the trials and all the stuff that's been done, and this vector's been around for a long time, I think the likelihood is really slim. Really slim. So guys, what experiment would you do to see if this vector integrated into the patient's genome? I know, I know, but I'm not going to say. <laughs> no, you can say it. I ask Go. you. No, Go no, 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 because I want to give the others a chance. I've always got my hand up. <laughs> well, Kathy knows and <laughs> Jibran knows. They all know. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead, Rich. I'm going to say a southern blot. That's what I would do, but we're old old people, you know, except for Brienne. But she would, what I would you say, would have done a, I also was going to do a southern blot. Would you, you would also, Kathy, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, because if you want to do PCR, that would be hard. You'd have to use vector sequences and go out. That That's just not. You do a southern blot on total genomic DNA. You digest it, you run it out, and you probe it. You hybridize it with um, vector. And you might see a single band, which integrates, indicates a single integration site, and then you can take it from there. Right. So, so another sure little nerdy, nerdy sidebar here. We used to do northerns all the time to look at messenger RNA. And then along comes RNA's protection. And since northerns are kind of a big sloppy job, everybody gets into RNA's protection. And then we do, oh, I guess there were... There were S1s as well. Mm -hmm. And now it's all PCR and sequencing and stuff. And there's a whole lot of information that you don't get from that. And people mm -hmm. have forgotten how to do Northerns. Mm -hmm. And Northerns are still, for many, many purposes, the way to go. So if you need Primer a Northern done, let me know. Yeah. Primer Primer extension. extension. 
primer extension, northern blot, S1 nuclease analysis, which then turned into RNase protection. Yeah. All right, let's do some email. Are we already at 12.30? Oh, my gosh. I'm Not quite exhausted. 12.30. Yeah. Here I thought we would get through a lot of email today. No. I never get it right. I never get it right. Well, we started a little late because of technical difficulties, too, so... Yeah. All right. Um, let me just take the first two here. First, Mark Martin, uh, who is a microbiologist, he's often on TWIM. He made these, uh, the, the tardigrade and the printed phage and the coronaviruses that are behind me here. He sent them to me. Good friend. Here's a haiku about you wrongly called a curm curmudgeon. Now, it's a correct thing to call me a curmudgeon for sure. But I appreciate your thought, Mark. Here's a, a haiku. Data do not lie. It's not rack and yelling to think critically. Critical thinking. And then let me just take Roberts. Dear Twiv gang, a big reason the Yeni Shed Out paper got so much attention was because it came from the Whitehead. Don't forget, David Baltimore was the founding director. So play, the place has RT in its DNA. Please forgive a bad molecular biology pun. <laughs> You are right to spend time pointing out all the paper's faults, but the status of an institution plays a big part in whether a journalist pays attention, and it does when the journalist asks other scientists for comments. A bioarchive paper from an obscure institution is far less likely to get attention. A place like the Whitehead has an obligation to be especially careful. In fact, unless there's an immediate public health concern, it probably should not even be posting on bioarchive. Excuse me. Keep up your great work. So this is from Robert Bazell. He's at Yale, but he's formerly from NBC. I guess he knows all about communication. Thank you, Robert. Those are good points. Um, yeah, and if he was formerly from NBC, he knows what, in particular in the media, the impact of a big name can have. All right, so that, now we have a bunch of emails. Uh, we got a bunch on um, this the computer security breach, and I don't want to read. The, the last one is too long, but we'll read two that are kind of short and summarily. And, and Kathy, if you could take that first one. Jill writes, hi, Vincent et al., just an IT person here. You're right. The breach is a big deal. It's estimated that over 18,000 companies and organizations are impacted and that the stowaway in the code has been there for months. Can you just patch? Not necessarily. In some cases, a total rebuild will be needed, which will require builds and testing. This will take a lot of time to work through. Interesting that this was done as most staff are on Christmas break and trying to use paid time off prior to year end. Also interesting that our President of the United States is downplaying the significance, as he also did the pandemic. You are right to be concerned. Here's a good go-to person slash blog for keeping up with this. And he gives a link to krebsonsecurity.com, K-R-E-B-S-O-N security.com. Oh, this is Jill. Thanks for continuing to educate us. I kept saying <laughs> Jill, but it's him, but it's, I think Jill is a she. Yeah, Thanks, I, I appreciate the link. Um, it's good to know. Because uh, I don't want to say anything because then people will say, you don't know what you're talking about, which would be right. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm um, uh, yes. I, I just want to, uh, as an anecdote, point out that uh, this in the pre-show, we were sitting here and I got an email from Kate Rubens on the space station. I, <laughs> I have an uh, email connection with her. And she says, she says, uh, sorry if I've seemed silent, but the hack knocked out the email to the space station for a couple of weeks, okay? And we're back online now. Wow. Yeah, that's pretty serious. I mean, you could endanger <laughs> people up there, right? Yeah. Yeah. That's terrible. Um, and then one more short one, uh, Brienne. Sure. John writes, Hi, Twiv. Love the show and listen all the time. Heard the call out for more info on the Solar Winds hack if you still need. Here's a nice update on what happened and what Microsoft did to mitigate. Um, and he gives a link. Um, and then he says, here's an emergency webcast update from SANS on the SolarWinds hack and steps FireEye and DHS have implemented to mitigate and what they recommend customers do. Um, and he gives a link to a YouTube video. Um, hope it helps. All my best, John. So the link he gives us, I'm just clicking on now. It's at geekwire.com. Great place. <laughs> Geekwire. <laughs> Death Star. So Solar Wind, Microsoft unleashes Death Star on Solar Wind hackers. Okay. Um, 
many people wrote in. We appreciate it. And we will put this all in the show notes so you can look at the links because I've already, I've looked at them and they're fascinating to me, even though I don't understand most of it. And then there's a very long email from Robert that we won't read, but he gives a lot of perspective on on this and, you know, how, how companies have dealt with it and so forth. Provides some links. Uh, he mentions the Home Depot, Target, Equifax, yeah. all these breaches in the past. And then, yeah. Talks a little bit about history. Um, I particularly like Stuxnet, a virus that was used mm-hmm. to infect air-gapped Iranian nuclear systems by way of a physical USB flash drive. So he says air-gapping, you keep computers separate, right? Systems separate, so they can't be infected. But if someone plugs a USB drive, <laughs> yeah, there you go. Have you ever been to a meeting where they have USB drives and they give them to you, right? Probably not a good idea to stick it in your computer unless it's yeah, like I, air-gapped. <laughs> I recall uh, uh, security checks at one point or another on some secure things that would actually, yet yeah, uh, they would uh, actually somehow scan or check your USB drive before it would accept it or something. Yeah. I don't know. Mm-hmm. Yep. Then there's another long one from Dan who said, finally, I know something about a topic we brought up on TWIV and, <laughs> and gives a lot of information about all of this and how it works and links. He said, most of it is public knowledge. Uh, and give some definitions at the end, like IT and OT. Wow. Spear phishing. <laughs> and he also provides a link to a music video, theory video, because I said I, I loved one, which I didn't understand. And he said, here's one. Uh, I love that. Spear phishing is emails targeted and crafted for specific people. Yep. It's great. Yeah. I didn't know that. Then there's just phishing, right? Which is for just anybody. I'm getting uh, I'm getting texts uh, okay. recently that this is the last day that I can buy uh, a concealed gun license. Uh, uh. In Texas, <laughs> yeah. why is the thing is the thing expiring? Uh. Okay, you got the wrong guy, dudes. Um, all right, so that brings us to now back to uh, biology and Rich. That's Rachel. Can you take hers, please? Oh. I was, uh, sorry, I was, uh, sorry. let me get myself, uh, Rachel, ah, here we go. Uh, Dear Vincent et al., I'm a big fan of the podcast. Thank you for all you're doing. Listen to 696 this weekend and wanted to share some resources that might be helpful for the question on school testing and the availability of the, oops. Sorry. What happened? Sorry. Okay. Uh, the availability of the new, how do you pronounce that, Elium? I guess. OTC Illum, over the counter I think. test. Illum. Uh, first, a quick plug for NIH is the Illum test benefited from funding from the NIH's RADx program. Gives a link to that. Uh, it will likely be a couple of months before the Illum test is commercially available in stores as they are still ramping up production. Here's a link to the article in the uh, Washington Post that has a bit of info on that. Gives a link to that. Uh, your listeners might also be interested in this free tool developed by NIT, uh, MIT with NIH funding to help organizations such as schools and businesses explore different testing strategies and gives links to a couple of those. Uh, fair, I haven't looked at the links, but I can imagine that this is very useful information. We get, you know, I get questions all the time about, you know, what tests are out there, uh, when's a rapid test going to be available, how much is it going to cost, blah, blah, blah. And looks like this email answers a lot of those questions. Yes. Thank you, Rachel. Rachel is special assistant yeah. to the NIH director for COVID-19 diagnostics. Wow. Oh, right. I'm, cool. I'm impressed that you're listening. I, I yeah, thought nobody... I think, I sounds like no she one, knows her stuff. I thought yeah. no one at NIH listens, but that's and good to know. And that'll be in the show notes, so if anybody wants for those sure. links, it'll be there. For sure. All right. Uh, Tom writes, love the show. I'm in the Moderna trial. So responding to the discussion around the review coming up on Thursday in TWIF 694. And that, of course, review was last week. And the EUA is out and people are being injected. Yeah, Nasal like swab. Tony Fauci. <laughs> you can... Do we know what the vaccine he got? Does he, they didn't tell yeah, us. Yeah, he got right? the Moderna. He and got what the about Moderna. Biden? Uh, I'm not sure I know about that. But Tony got the Moderna. It would make sense. Since yeah. Yep. 
the NIH connection. Le- I, okay, so nasal swabs are done at the time of shot one and again at shot two. There is a third visit at 30 days post shot two for blood samples, about nine, but no additional NP swabs at this visit. As far as I know, the only reporting of infection after shot two is triggered by reporting of symptoms. The app also asks for exposure to others that are infected. So they may sample people who have been exposed, but I don't think they do unless one is symptomatic. Subs are NP swabs done by medical staff. None are self-swabs. Um, one of the trials had self-swabbing. Don't remember which one. When in the sick arm of the trial, NP swabs are collected immediately for various respiratory diseases, RSV, flu, others, and for SARS-CoV-2, self-collected saliva samples are collected on day 3, 5, 7, 9, 14, and 21, post-symptoms in the sick arm. These are used for vial quantitation to monitor disease progress. I've been impressed with the team running the Moderna trial. Great science, great logistics, great impact on the pandemic. I am unbelievably excited for, by the progress being made by RNA vaccines this year. We'll look back 20 years from now and be amazed at the impact that RNA vaccine technology will have on our ability to respond rapidly to future emerging disease threats. I agree. I agree with that. It's been amazing. Can you imagine less than a year after we started, we have vaccines being injected into people? It's really amazing. Uh, right. It's a new standard, right? We'll never yeah, say really, we can't make vaccines yeah. quickly again. <laughs> I'm really interested to see the long-term uh, impact of this. Uh, and and first on my list, I've said this before, is the uh, respiratory syncytial virus vaccine because that's been a bugaboo for a long time. Yeah. And I wouldn't be at all surprised if this wasn't um, uh, an important lead on that. Anyway, Tom, thank you for the information. It's useful mm-hmm. to know this. Uh, and- I just want to comment too that if going back to our discussion about the the uh, variant virus, that if it turned out that we needed to make a new vaccine, mm, yeah. I heard an estimate today that it would take six weeks to get the RNA and so forth into the platform. Of course, it would take longer than that to if a new trial was needed and new approval and so forth. But we can now move forward very quickly if yeah. we see that we need to do that. So I'm trying to think, would there be an mRNA flu vaccine? Should, we talked about that. It. Why yeah. not? We you talked about make that. You the- right? Yeah, right. For sure. And I think that that is somewhere we, I think Vincent found it somewhere in the I landscape think, uh, or something. we asked uh, Kismikia. She was, yeah. she talked about it. Yeah. She said it was something. being done, but they were not focused on it right now. I, I'm not sure why. Because that would really streamline that whole process, too. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, I agree. I think you, I mean, Moderna has CMV and HIV mRNA vaccines in their pipeline, probably RSV also. And I think that's great. Really interesting to see. All right, Kathy. <clears throat> and writes, hi, thanks so much for your podcast. It keeps me calm to hear someone knowing what they're talking about. My question for y'all is, who is deciding which healthcare workers get the vaccine right now and how? I'm a physician in a psychiatric hospital in the suburbs of New York City. Many patients and several staff died here during the peak of the pandemic when there was no PPE. As of right now, I've been given no information on when to expect a vaccine, except recently I was told that the state won't pay for the freezers, so we'll probably get the Moderna vaccine. Our patients mostly come from jail and are too psychiatrically ill to understand masking and social distancing. It's not unusual for these patients to become violent and spit on, or spit on people. We don't have a way to effectively quarantine them away from other patients. Now there's surgical masks and face shields, and we're being told that's sufficient if a patient tests positive, even though it's obviously not. When I see my colleagues who work in high-risk but sterile environments getting vaccinated and Congress getting vaccinated for some reason, I can't help but wonder if we'll be forgotten about because no one thinks of a psychiatric hospital when they think of COVID. Thanks, N. My understanding is that this varies on a state-by-state basis as to how states want to roll out and take the CDC priority recommendations and and tweak them. So I don't know the details for New York City with respect to psychiatric hospitals. Maybe that's something that Daniel will know or Vincent. I don't know, but um, you need to write Cuomo and be very noisy, Okay. And at some point you will get attention. And, you know, just by putting it here, maybe someone listening can help you. Um, but it's not acceptable. I agree. Um, 
I, I heard early on that prisons were going to get, you know, early immunization. I don't know what's happening there, um, but um, I think it's important. I agree with you. So, so if anyone knows, uh, Daniel, I'll ask Daniel tomorrow. Tomorrow's Thursday, yeah. And um, if anyone else knows, but I would say, N, you should make some noise and uh, you can get someone's attention up in uh, Albany because, yes, it's, it's on a state-by-state -state basis. How many degrees of separation do you suppose we have from Cuomo? Uh, I, I don't know about TWIV, but I've been contacted by his office before. So, you know, I could I could email that person, but it's not I don't think it's my job to do that. No. <clears throat> I don't think Cuomo listens to TWIV, but maybe somebody two or three layers down does. Someone Could does, and I up. think that's how they got hold of me to begin with. <clears throat> anyway, um, Brianne, you're next. Sure. Liz writes, please help. I can't find what I think I heard. On an earlier episode, I think I remember a conversation about an initiative to bring testing availability to schools through parent-teacher organizations. Our community might finally be amenable to such a generous initiative, and I can't find the information any longer. We are in a fastest growth in the country metro, and I need really need to do something. I'd love to take this information before our PTAs. Thank you for your valuable podcasts. I'm a regular listener and recommend TWIB to everyone who will listen. Thanks again, Liz from Knoxville, Tennessee. Um, so, so see above Rachel's email where she says, yeah. here's the way to help organizations such as schools explore different testing strategies, when to test.org and another NIH link. So those will uh, be in the show notes. Yeah, I remember a previous question that we maybe didn't have an answer to. Um, but I don't remember actually having the answer. And I think Rachel's email is probably the most informative thing. Mm -hmm. uh, Rich, can you take the next one? So how do I pronounce this? Is it Sunra Sunrisa? Yeah. Sunrisa? Sunrisa writes, and she just sent us an image uh, <laughs> of a, uh, looks like a test, a kid's <laughs> math test where there's a word problem. And the word problem says, there are 26 kids at the beach, then 37 more kids come. How many kids are there at the beach now? And in a kid's scrawl under that, it says, too many for COVID-19. <laughs> That's great. Very good. <laughs> I love it. And she's yes. a math teacher. Yeah. I love it. You can take the next one, Rich. Jose writes, hi, Twivers. Only a single question this time. Do you know if either in the Pfizer or in the Moderna trial, autoantibodies against muscle developed after the vaccination? Are they safe to be recommended in patients with myositis? Thank you. I don't know a specific answer to that question. I kind of, that sounds like a very specific investigation. Yeah, I don't think I they. I don't not, think they're looking. Not right? necessarily expect. No. Uh, uh, whether you know, I wouldn't be at all surprised if they kept track of individuals who had myositis to look and see if they had any adverse side effects. I don't know, but I, mean, anyway, I can't. I can't specifically answer that question. They're they're collecting a lot of blood, and you know, at some point they could look for autoantibodies, but. Um, as, as far as I know, they have not done that yet. It was not in the report that was sent to the FDA, which we linked last time. Uh, Lauren writes uh, from Seattle where it's dark, cloudy, and HC46F281 Kelvin. A brief update from inside the Moderna study. If the EUA is granted, they say they will offer us phase three participants some options. Stay in the study or get unblinded. See their below for details and I, I pasted uh, an email from Moderna. Unblinded control group members would then also have the option of getting the vaccine possibly as soon as the next two or three weeks. Staying in the study would be good for science, but I feel like I should really just get the vaccine. I am assuming that any vaccine I get would be coming from the study and Moderna, not from my state's allotment of the federal government's purchases. I may have to ask is this unfamiliar feeling in my chest some form of optimism? <laughs> 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 Wonderful. Um, 
I think it would come from Moderna, yeah. Quite interesting. Um, and so obviously the EUA has been granted, so Lauren should uh, know. But anyway, this uh, below I reproduce a email, Dear Cove Study Volunteer. I'm not going to read the whole thing, but um, it talks about the EUA and what happens, right? And And it basically outlines what Lauren told us. You can be unblinded and get it, or you can continue. Um, <clears throat> personally, if you ask me, I would continue in the study to help power it more. Um, but I can understand others wanting to get the vaccine. Um, what would you guys do? Is that fair to ask? Sure. I would be very conflicted. Yeah. I, I can't answer that question right now. That's okay. one of those things. That's one of those questions where I think about this all the time. You know, it's easy to sit here and say how you would react in a given situation, but it's hard to know until you're actually there, okay? Yeah. I would have a hard time with that one. That's a tough one. Uh, and I would probably try and rationalize it to myself by saying that even if I uh, opted out and took the vaccine, that uh, they would probably get data from me. They've probably gotten data from me already, and they would probably get more data from me on a, what do they call it, uh, I, I assume that those people, they'll continue to track them in an observa mm -hmm. observational fashion. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so they say here in this letter, our plan is to provide mRNA to all placebo participants. However, if mRNA vaccine is not yet available and you have the opportunity to protect yourself by receiving another vaccine, you can reach out to your study doctor to request unblinding and discontinuation from the study if you received placebo. I don't know. I guess... They may not have enough, right, to take care of other study participants. I don't know. Lauren has to ask, obviously. Well, and didn't, Brianne, didn't you say that people, if they were unblinded, at least in one of these, they would, they would then have the option of getting the vaccine in their ordinary priority order? That was discussed at the, um, the FDA meeting for Pfizer. I didn't right. listen okay. to the, the meeting for Moderna. Right. They say something very interesting here in this letter. Even once you know you've been vaccinated against COVID-19, please continue other public health measures to limit spread of disease, including wearing of masks and social distancing. That's very good. Mm -hmm. uh, Kathy. Omer writes, hi, Twig gang. I just listened to Sunday's episode. Great episode as always. I just wanted to point out that the 95% confidence interval for Chadox-1 vaccine LD slash SD. L low dose, standard dose. Oh, thank you. Low dose, standard dose, effectiveness at preventing asymptomatic infections is 1% to 83%. In other <laughs> words, we really don't have a clue. The <laughs> Pfizer and Moderna papers and submissions don't speculate on the matter since they also don't have enough data. I thought simply quoting the point estimate of 58.9% could be misleading, especially with that level of precision. Decisions about who should get the vaccines first should probably rely on data from other vaccines and viruses as a prior. Maybe you can address this in the next episode. Keep up the good work, Omer. Yeah, I, I, I we should have pointed that out because they always give the confidence interval and man, mm -hmm. that's broad. That's really broad. Yeah, 1% <laughs> uh, to 83%. Did, we did point out that um, when you uh, break out the data into the two groups, uh, since it's taking the, you know, the whole group and breaking it up into subgroups, in particular with the low-dose group, it's not many people, yeah. okay? Yeah. Now, what what is Omer saying here? Decisions about who should get vaccines first should probably rely on data from other vaccines, viruses as a prior. I don't understand no, that. No, I'm not, I'm not buying that. I mean, okay. the, the point about this is that they checked asymptomatic infections and they found a low efficacy, which, which basically nothing because we have such a broad interval. That's fine. But I don't know about who gets first has to do with that. Well, yeah, maybe he's just saying just take a historical look at how other vaccine rollouts happened and were there any consequences of decisions made about yeah. priorities that might need to be considered, which I would think that the public health people were already doing. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, a lot of people have written and asked if I've already had COVID, can I get vaccinated? Or is, is, you know, it depends on the state. Some states are going to put you lower down. And some people have written that if you've been mm. infected, you get it later, which 
seems to me not to make a lot of sense because we don't know what your titer is and if you're going to be protected and so forth, but it's a state-by-state -state basis. Uh, Brienne, can you take the next one? Sure. Amy writes, I'm a 38-year-old graphic designer from Wisconsin. It's currently 34 and cloudy. I'm writing to comment on the discussion on episode 696 about my age group not feeling threatened by the virus. I agree that it's a huge problem, and, I wholehearted, and I'm wholeheartedly with Alan that a unified message from the government would be a great solution. In March, I realized that I needed to find some good sources of scientific information about COVID-19 beyond the short amounts of time that the health officials were actually allowed to speak during the coronavirus press briefings. It took some time to find you guys, but once I did, I regularly listened to TWIV, JAMA Network, the Osterholm Update, and MedCram. This added up to many hours a week, but I am used to listening to podcasts and audiobooks while working, exercising, and doing household chores, so making time for science education was easy and enjoyable. I eagerly started sharing what I was learning with my friends. They listened at first, but soon came to think that I was overreacting. They had heard nurses that they, that they know express doubts about the pandemic's severity early on. They saw the commercials from CDC that seemed to only be warning of bad outcomes for those with severe health conditions or over 65. I can't even blame them for not believing me. I don't have any background in science or medicine, and I was the only person telling them that this virus was killing people even younger than us. At the time, the media seemed to have more stories about 90-year-olds that recovered than young people who ended up in the hospital or of long haulers. Eventually, one of my friends knew two people that ended up in the hospital. It was only then that she wanted to talk about COVID-19 with me and was very interested in what I said. In my office, there have been several people who have gotten the virus. The ones who had mild symptoms only reinforced to others that they don't need to be afraid. One person in her 20s experienced severe symptoms, but she was an anti-masker and a Trump supporter, so she might have felt a little embarrassed to talk about it. On social media, most of the posts in my feed lean liberal, but even there I only saw messages about wearing masks as a kindness to others and not because there is reason for everyone to fear getting the virus. The altruism message is probably enough to motivate most people to mask up when going into a store or to physically distance from grandma, but it's not enough to make them change their behavior around their peers. We all know that some people seem to be so brainwashed from misinformation that there is no convincing them. But I think if every American was listening to someone speak as frankly and honestly as Daniel Griffin, Mike Osterholm, or all of you TWIV superstars, the countries would be in a much different place. I think most people will make the responsible decision when they have all the facts. It's human nature, though, to avoid doing the hard thing, the thing you desperately don't want to do, if you're given reason to think that it's not that important. In my opinion, younger people in the country have been have constantly been bombarded with information leading them to believe that serious outcomes among people like them are outliers and not many people are willing to alter their lives for something that seems like a long shot. Thank you so much for all you guys do. I'm so grateful. I'll continue to be a listener even after we're past this current tragedy. Keep on twiving, my friends. Sincerely, Amy. Hmm. That's great. Yeah, that is great. And I agree with everything that you say, uh, Amy, as a fellow member of that age group. I got so many emails from people who said, how do you know those excess deaths were COVIDs and not car accidents of people who were upset about the pandemic? People are driving less. Hello. <laughs> Seriously? <laughs> I mean, they, they, I mean, they just want to deny it at every level. So anyway, I um, think this is great to hear it because I don't know. And, and um, Brianna already knows that we have to, she has to be careful. So it's good to know. I don't know how you, you fix this. This is obviously a communication problem, right? You can't preach, but you have to somehow emphasize that it's important. But the messaging has changed throughout this pandemic. Because, yeah, in the beginning, we said only, only old people really get seriously ill. And so it's hard to change a message you've already given, right? Yeah. Did any of you guys see Doonesbury last Sunday? Do you read Doonesbury? No. no. They had him. Uh, they had uh, BD wearing a mask 
in a store with a whole bunch of people not wearing masks, and they were all shaming him, telling him he was a, a sissy and shouldn't be wearing a mask and all that kind of stuff. And he sort of puts up with it and gets his purchase. And as he's going out, he holds the door open to this big virus wearing shades that's about to go into the store. <laughs> and he says, they're all yours. <laughs> that's great. I like that. I like that. Um, you know, I w it's not quite related, but somewhat. Well, it's a pandemic, right? I was at the post office this morning. I got there early, so I would be there when it opened and avoid the line. And I'm looking at the sign. It says, wearing a mask is recommended in this post office. What? And obviously, that's what the federal government has done. They have not said. But then they say um, only six people are allowed in at one time. And that's, a, that's strong. Only six people are allowed in. But... Don't no, recommended to wear a mask. Now, I have to say everyone there was wearing a mask for people and everyone I've ever seen, it's pretty good. But um, boy, I was surprised at that. Yeah. Speaking of masks, do you want to tell us about this paper? Uh, sure. Yeah. This is something that actually I saw because uh, Brianne retweeted about it, but it's a paper from Lindsay Marr, who's at Virginia Tech, and Monica Gandhi, who's a, a clinician I believe, at UC San Francisco about masks. And it's uh, basically, uh, I was scrolling down for the part about shaming, but um, uh, they summarize the evidence on face masks from both the infectious disease and physical science viewpoints. And they standardize recommendations on the, the best type of masks for protection to the public, provide guidelines on how to get the message across. And... Uh, they do say in no uncertain terms that there's clear evidence that masks will protect the wearer as well as everyone else. And the thing that I wanted to point out um, <laughs> when Rich was talking about the Doonesbury comic, mask shaming or calling individuals selfish for not wearing a mask is the most ineffective way to achieve public trust in public health, to achieve trust in public health officials and should not be part of our messaging. And then, parenthetically, they don't say it, but with masking, we are recommending a new non-pharmacological intervention for the American public that was not previously a part of our cultural norms. This NPI will be necessary to adhere to for some time as we achieve equitable and widespread distribution of a safe and effective vaccine. So, you know, I will admit that, you know, when I saw pictures in the past of people in Asia wearing masks, I just thought that was just some kind of odd paranoia and stuff. And this is well before the pandemic. But, uh, you know, now there's pretty clear evidence of it being efficacious. And it's something that, you know, we've started to become more used to seeing and doing. And it's uh, becoming part of our cultural norms. Yeah. yeah. And masks are cool. Thank yeah, uh, which reminds me, I have to send you guys your mask. I'm going to have to go back to the post office. <laughs> <laughs> One more from uh, from Rich, please. Colin writes, hello, first time listener here. Saw your podcast, shared on social media. Near the start of the latest episode, there was dialogue around COVID-19 being harmful to young people, 25 to 44. And the cast seemed to be stuck on the question of, quote, how do we convince the youth to take this seriously, end quote. I am a 25-year-old male resident of Seattle, so if you genuinely want to answer that question, you're welcome to my perspective. I'm very selective with my response to COVID-19. <clears throat> I wear a mask in closed public spaces, supermarkets, because... Uh, this is where I risk transmitting something to someone else who had no choice to interact with me. I haven't seen my parents since the start of this because their age group is at higher risk of death. However, I still gather regularly and indoors now that it's cold with my friends. We're all less than 30 years old. We've done our best to understand what we can about the disease. And after evaluating the risks, we've decided that the likelihood slash possibility of ill outcomes are worth the benefit of each other's company when 
asymptomatic, plain and simple. Uh, We'll come back to that. Uh, It's possible I've evaluated the risks incorrectly. Mostly I've been using CDC numbers, which put my age group at about uh, 1,100 deaths since March. And one hospitalized per thousand, she gives a couple of links. He gives a couple of links to those data. I can be convinced to act differently by being presented with good data that presents a better view of the risks. I'm being truthful here. I embrace changing my opinions because I have a lifelong love for learning. Up through August, I was way more cautious, but by September, we had solid enough measurements for everything except long-term effects of the disease by age group that I reevaluated the risks. Like you said, a national mask mandate won't be likely to have actual significant effects, nor would the U.S. Supreme Court enforce that kind of measure. We can't legislate our way out of the pandemic, though legislation can help. Science can inform us of the risks, but it doesn't command us to respond to those risks in a particular way. The history of this country is based on individuality, where every person is responsible for making their own decisions. If you want a person to behave differently, the way to do that is to listen to their opinions, understand why they hold the beliefs they do, and then share a more compelling story than the one they are presently embracing. Anyway, if you're looking for some insight into how do we convince the youth to take this seriously, there's my perspective. It's sometimes hard for me to tell genuine curiosity apart from willful ignorance. So if any of this letter is worthwhile to you, please write back with at least some acknowledgement. That way I know to continue sharing my opinion with those who claim uh, to not understand the behavior of my demographic during this time that we're in. Be well, Colin. Okay. I really appreciate that. Okay, because that's an honest perspective on what's going on. And my personal reaction to that is that the behavior that he describes with uh, a whole bunch of people who figure they're asymptomatic getting together and having a party is exactly what the problem is. Okay, and the uh, situation that he describes where everybody was being real careful. Okay, but then, you know, things kind of calmed down and we got a lot more data and we evaluated the risks and we decided that we were safe to go ahead and do this is exactly the problem. Okay, and under those situations, you can have one or two asymptomatic people cooking up disease. Okay, and uh, uh, they'll never know it at the party. And it's not until sometime uh, down the road that they infect somebody that is susceptible, maybe with never knowing themselves, uh, and and you get a, a bloom. Now, it could be that in your particular social, it could be that this is, is sufficiently rare, that in your particular social group, okay, you have not seen an incidence of that. But I think if you look at the whole population globally, it's that mindset that's contributing to the problem right now. By the way, um, so you may be careful with your parents, but your friends may not be. They may not be careful with older people. You don't know how they behave, and that's the problem because if they get infected, they're going to transmit it to someone else. So that's one issue. And the second is I think your numbers are low, 1,100 deaths since March. The paper we looked at uh, looked at excess, excess deaths right, in a smaller period. And it's much higher than than you think it is. And that's why we asked on that episode what can be done. So um, I do appreciate your candor. I don't know why you would think we claim not to understand the behavior of this demographic. We, we were genuinely curious because we're not in that demographic. And as we said, Brianne knows what to do because she's a scientist and probably also... <laughs> would not would also know even if she weren't a scientist what yeah. to do. <laughs> I, I I think there's one thing that makes it hard for me to totally um answer some of Colin's questions. Um and that is he mentions that, you know, he sees his friends. Um but he doesn't really talk about things more than that. Um and this is something that I've noticed when people have asked me about what behaviors I am or am not doing. I I describe my mask usage and my distancing and things like that. And then they look at me and they say, oh, well, well, you didn't mention that you never go to bars. (laughs) And I'm like, of course I never go to bars. That one was so obvious. I didn't think I needed to say it. Um, And so things like, you know, what is he doing? Is that a 
a party with a hundred friends is that dinner with one friend. <laughs> um, you know, things like that. He doesn't really mention is this indoor dining, um, what's going on. So I, I will say that to me, um, I, I don't know what to make of C Colin's description. Um, because I think that there's a wide array of things that could be described by what he's describing. Um, and some of those I would be very, I would find very problematic and others I would find less so. Um, and I can't make that decision because I've noticed that my friends might all make descriptions that are similar to this and in fact be doing a wide range of different things. Yeah, in my response, I was assuming a fairly large group of individuals indoors unmasked. Yeah, I agree Under with some, you. Circum, uh, some circumstance or another. And I, yeah. would, uh, I would point out that uh, it's, uh, uh, sometimes on the show, we have confessed to being in our 20s at one point or another and doing incredibly stupid stuff and being lucky to be alive, okay? So I do know what that's like. Uh, I, as a matter of fact, I will confess pu publicly here to having <laughs> smoked probably a couple of hundred thousand cigarettes in my hundred thousand, wow. Oh, yeah, I've done the calculation a few times. So you're a big smoker. You bet. I didn't know that. When I first God. met you, you had stopped. Oh. And, and that's only one of my bad habits. <laughs> <laughs> then you know, I stop. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, that's I'm, true. I, I'm trying to look at the um, the link that he sent for the CDC, and I'm having a hard time parsing that. But I had found another um, CDC site that compares hospitalization and death by age. And they use 18 to 29-year-olds as the comparison group. And so if you compare hospitalization to somebody in the 65 to 74 year old group, which includes some of us, um, a comparison group is one fifth as likely to require hospitalization. But um, it, I, I'm trying to find the data on the, the number of deaths that just seems not right to me, but mm -hmm. I don't know. Depends when, when Colin sent this also, I don't know. Yeah. It was in the, since the 696, right? Oh, right, yeah. Which we just did, and we talked about this, yeah. All right, I was going to stop there, but let me just mention the next one because it's got a picture that will be out of date by the next <laughs> uh, TWIV. This is from Nanette who, Nanette, who is a DVM in Sarasota. And she says, uh, I'm not a virologist. I make my living from viruses. I'm a veterinarian and discuss viral diseases every single day, some treatment and a lot of prevention via vaccination. Brianne had these viral snowflakes as a pick of the week. I made some for our tree. I was happy to see Khaleesi. Nice. You took some with you. <laughs> I, I brought them with me and we made them here. So I have a whole pile of them here. This nice. is the coronavirus. Nice. Excellent. Calissi, adeno, blue tongue, since they're veterinary pathogens, but of course I also had to make corona in an RNA vaccine. Uh, it was therapeutic to sit quietly and cut while appreciating science and all it does for the world. And, and Nan sent a photo of her tree uh, oh, with these viruses great. on it. I just put Excellent. it in because I had forgotten to do that. That's very cool. Yeah. And um, thank you, Nan. 72 degrees. Yeah, I can see out the window there. Mm -hmm. Looks nice. <laughs> that might be a good episode image. Yes, I was just thinking the same thing. Yes. And uh, Junji um, sends links to watching Dr. Fauci and President-elect Biden receiving their coronavirus vaccines, which is great. I'm very happy that the president-elect and the head of the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases have been uh, recorded doing that. That's really nice. And Francis Collins and Azar, too, were in the same loop that I saw for uh, that included Fauci. Cool. Now, any celebrities yet? No, because they're probably too young, right? Oh, um, Ian it. McKellen. <laughs> the British I Ian actor. McKellen? Yeah. yeah. He's, uh, he's in a high-risk group. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, I saw, interestingly, I, I saw, uh, PBS NewsHour, an interview with a woman who's a, sounded like a personnel manager for the NBA, talking about starting a new NBA season and saying, uh, no, they're not going to get vaccinated. Okay. Because, you know, they're not first in line. Mm 
Yeah. They're yeah. not, Good. Uh, you know, they're going to they're gonna do their thing in a bubble, but they aren't going to do the celebrity vaccination thing. Yeah. Now, please do not write and say, Vincent, but you said you don't like celebrities. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's, actually, it's not that I don't like them. I just, I'm not in awe of them. Uh, but- I know that people respond to celebrities and getting vaccinated would help, you know, as they, they got Elvis out to get the polio vaccine way back when. That made a big deal because people love them. It's mm -hmm. fine if, but I don't, I, <laughs> th I do think he wrote some cool songs though. <laughs> I agree with that. All right. Pick time, pick of the week. Brianne, what do you have? Um, I have a podcast episode um, from a group called EM Rap, um, which is a, a podcast for emergency medicine physicians. Um, they asked me to join them for an episode earlier in December talking about vaccines. Um, I was sort of the, the first time they'd had a non-MD uh, come on, and they, they f thought that was just fascinating. Um, but then the episode that I have here is a more recent episode where they actually had multiple different guests back for a live show to highlight their episode and answer questions um, from listeners. And so there, I was there for the whole episode and I found all of the other speakers fascinating. Um, so there was a speaker who was talking about um, COVID-19 palliative care um, and how um, they were caring for patients who had very severe COVID at end of life. They were talking about how they were making decisions about which drugs to use. Um, they were talking about sort of inequalities between different groups. Um, and I, I just felt like I was learning so much simply by, you know, sitting there waiting for my turn to speak. Um, and so especially for listeners who really like some of Daniel Griffin's updates, um, I think that uh, some of the things that the other speakers here were talking about were really fascinating. Um, in addition, if you watch the sort of first 10 minutes or so of the episode, um, they made a an animation kind of explaining how the virus was not that bad and also terrible um, to talk about sort of impacts on the healthcare system. Um, and it was a really nice animation that I've shared with quite a few people who are not scientists and they found it very helpful. Um, so I, I really learned a lot from everyone else who was a part of that episode. Cool. That looks really great. I'm going to yeah. watch that. Yeah. Hang on. Yeah, Sorry. They're, they're all fascinating um, in terms of all the things that they, they talked about. And I felt like it was just such a good learning experience for me. I was going to say something and I forgot it. Okay. Um, um, these show notes are slow today. Have you noticed that? Maybe they're getting too long again. <laughs> I'm okay. Maybe, maybe the pictures are too big. Okay. Thank you, Brianne. Uh, Rich, what do you have for us? Uh, I have a uh, pick that's about critical thinking, <laughs> uh, which is uh, the story of Chicken Little, um, is, which uh, probably almost everybody understands is uh, a, it actually turns out it's a uh, uh, old uh, European folktale. Uh, about a chicken who uh, an acorn is dropped on his head or her head by a bird. And she uh, decides the sky is falling and needs to tell the king and goes running around saying the sky is falling and recruits a big gang of people. Uh, and ultimately they run across Foxy Loxy, who takes advantage of this to eat them all, except for chicken little depending on how the story ends there's a thousand <laughs> versions there's a thousand versions of this okay uh and i picked one that you could get on a pdf i'm disappointed in the ending of this particular one um and i used to have a book that was about a four inch square little leather bound volume that was published in 1916 that i think was inscribed by my grandmother probably to my father Okay, that was delightful that I read as a child and I've somehow lost that. At any rate, I've uh, picked the, uh, um, the PDF here and also a wiki link to the uh, fairy tale. The wiki link is headed Henny Penny because if you go to, which is one of the characters, if you go to uh, Chicken Little, you get the Disney animation, which was an anti-Nazi propaganda uh, uh, animated version of it that was published in 1943. At any rate, the sky is not falling. <laughs> That's a great song by um, what's what's the guy, the guitarist? Uh, the sky is falling. 
you guys don't know who this is. It is by, um, <sighs> all right, I got to find this. The sky is falling. I will cut this out. Um, Stevie Ray Vaughan. Oh, Austin dude. Oh, he's from Austin, stat- really? Yeah, his statue's down by the lake. Oh, I didn't know that. I yeah, he's a big deal. His playing. Oh, man. man. man oh, he has his a great song just- called The Sky is Full. Maybe it's an album also. I really like it. It's the first thing I thought of when I saw it. It's one of your title suggestions. Kathy, what do you have? You're muted. Kathy's muted. I was afraid that uh, a YouTube was going to auto load, <laughs> so I muted myself. Uh, I have two kind of timely picks. One is the conjunction of Jupiter and Saturn, which most people have probably seen something about in the news. And so this is the astronomy picture of the day uh, from today. And uh, so it's a, a very cool picture of the conjunction. And I thought that I was not going to be able to see it because a cloudy forecast was in the works for the entire week. But evidently, you can see it up till the end of the year. So they're getting farther and farther apart now. They were closest on Monday night for the solstice. But uh, I was able to see it last night. Gorgeous. And it was it was great. <laughs> And it was uh, it was so much easier than seeing that comet last summer. Uh, we went five different nights to the open schoolyard near my house to see it, and and we didn't manage to see How it. How close until, did they get, Kathy? Oh, uh, I think it was like one one degree or point one degree. It's very, very close, close. Right? Oh, very cool. very close. Yeah, I I'll send you a picture from my camera. But um, anyway, and then the second thing is uh, since we were talking about uh, Tony Fauci being on the. Uh, PBS News Hour and so forth. Um, I also saw it's a really cute thing where Elmo and uh, other kids are worried about uh, Santa Claus and he, can he come to your house because of the pandemic? <laughs> and Tony explains <laughs> that he went to the North Pole and he immunized S- Santa Claus and he is good to go. And it's just really <laughs> cute. If you're a fan of Tony Fauci, it's worth checking this out because he's just got this twinkle in his eye. And it's great. Yeah, it is good. Tony's, so. Tony's going to be 80 years old on Christmas Eve. Yep. Wow. Yep. Tomorrow. Yep. Oh, God, is that tomorrow? Holy cow. Yes. Wow, he's a, <laughs> he, would you say he's become a cultural hero? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. He's like, got bobblehead dolls and yeah. That's great. For sure. That's really good. Um, my pick is virological.org. I don't know if we've ever picked this, but I really like this uh, website. It's very, very geeky. It's not for everybody, but if you want to look into genomics of viruses, there are lots of uh, resources and there's um, articles written about it. You know, like here, August 9th, the Sarbico virus origin of SARS-CoV-2 furin cleavage site. What? Better reading for Christmas Eve in front of a crackling <laughs> fire than that. I think that's great. So check that out, virological.org. I really like that name, virological. V-I-R-O-L-O-G. Too long for a license plate, sadly, because that would be a good license plate. All right, we have two listener picks, one from Greg, a YouTube video, which if I remember is about climate change, right? In, yes, uh, yes, it's uh, the Alaska, I mean, uh, Australia, Australia uh, beekeeper. Right. Yes, I a started beekeeper, to watch right. it, I haven't finished it yet. May yeah. give courage to others, Greg writes. And then Uli, good evening. I thought you might enjoy this XKCD comic about statistics and the SARS-CoV-2 vaccine data. Uh, the alt text when you mouse over the image says, we reject the null hypothesis based on the hot damn, check out this chart check test. <laughs> 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 yeah, that's a great cartoon. And this is a, kind of a redrawing of the figures from the FDA submissions of uh, Pfizer and Moderna, where they showed over time the number of cases in the placebo and, and vaccine group. And I love the bottom. This is what I say all the time. Statistics tip. Always try to get data that's good enough that you don't need to do statistics on it. 
And you know, in, in virology, if you work on polio, you grow it grows so well, you have no problem getting tenfold and more differences, and it's great. And I have to say, I had a student defend a few years ago, and she was showing graphs of growth curves, you know, where the virus is growing to eight logs, and then, you know, a drug is added, and there's a five log reduction. And wouldn't you know it, somebody on her committee says, but where are the error bars? And... <laughs> She didn't know what to say. So I said, for God's sakes, it's a five log difference. <laughs> and he said, yeah, but still, Vinny. <laughs> okay. Um, so I would like, yeah, I think that's great. Try to get data that's good. You know, of course, you can't try, but it depends on the system. But, you know, you, you get what you get. Yeah, I grew up without error bars on my plaque assays. And, yeah, uh, yeah. you know, when they started wanting error bars on every single plaque assay, yeah. I, I knew it was time to retire. 30 years into, <laughs> or 25 years into my career, you know, we submitted a paper and one of the reviewers says, you need error bars on this plaque assay, which I'd never done before. So now we do everything three times and we can make error bars. Okay. That's TWIF 697. Microbe.tv slash TWIV are the show notes. Send your questions and comments to TWIV at microbe.tv. I love your emails. They're great. All of them are really, um, really interesting. They're well written. And except for the ones that are highly critical, <laughs> they're very fun to read. <laughs> highly critical ones are more difficult, although I sometimes I understand the criticisms. Twim, TWIV at microbe.tv. If you like what we do, support us, please. Uh, microbe.tv slash contribute. Rich Condit, who's an emeritus professor, University of Florida, Gainesville. Thank you, Rich. Sure enough, always a good time. Brian Barker at Drew University on bio, on Twitter, Bioprof Barker. Thanks, Brian. Thanks, it was great to be here. Kathy Spindler's at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. Thank you, Kathy. Thanks, this is a lot of fun. Kathy's, I can tell she's looking in the camera more. She's gotten influenced by Alan, right? Uh, I've tried to do it all along, but I, I don't remember always you, remember. A, a long time ago, you said, Alan, how do you look at the camera all the time? Right? <laughs> I noticed well, you've been doing it lately. This, this um, recording software doesn't allow us to scrunch up everybody's view into a linear line where yeah. I could have everybody's picture right under the camera. So it's, it's a little bit harder. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.blog. I'd like to thank the American Society for Virology and the American Society for Microbiology for their support of TWIV and Ronald Jenkins for the music. This episode of TWIV was recorded, edited, and posted by me, Vincent Racaniello. You've been listening to This Week in Virology. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back, actually, next week. <laughs> Have a good holiday. Another TWIV is viral. <laughs> <laughs>